reflect on the seven pillars of wisdom, and we'll be, uh, if not today, probably next Sunday, disclosing what those seven pillars are, but right now we're just laying some groundwork, Proverbs 9 and 1. Wisdom hath builded her house, she hath hewn out her seven pillars. So there are seven pillars that can be delineated, seven pillars that can be articulated. Verse 2, wisdom, speaking in the plural, uh, in the feminine sense of wisdom, wisdom, she hath killed her beasts, she hath mingled her wine, she also hath furnished her table, she hath sent forth her maidens, she crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. So wisdom is crying this. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him. So wisdom is saying to someone who needs understanding, Come, eat of my bread, drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. And then Solomon switches gears and begins to speak to his audience. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. He that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. You can tell who is wise and who is not by the way they respond to discipline and the way they respond to any kind of constructive criticism. A scorner hates you because of it. A wise person says, thank you for taking the time to speak to me. I'm going to be a better person because of that. Give instructions to a wise man, he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Everybody say the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. So that's the foundation right there. If you want wisdom, you got to have a fear of God. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, the years of thy life shall be increased. How many would like to live a good, full, long life, a healthy life? We have to have wisdom in order to do that. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself, but if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. All right, so we're picking up on our lesson on the seven pillars of wisdom. Now, uh, I tell you, we are having some issues with YouTube for whatever reason. Uh, back in the day, Brother Russell hooked us up with YouTube, got our account open. There's been some kind of virus that has attacked uh, his account and our account, and both accounts have been from what Brother Freddie tells me, and I may not be using the terminology right, both accounts uh, may have been compromised in some sense, and uh, we were locked out. So Brother Freddie is going to create a brand new YouTube page. The good news is all of our archives from way back to 2012 are still there. We just can't put new stuff on the current YouTube channel. So we're going to open a brand new YouTube channel, and when you go to YouTube, there will be New Life Tabernacle 1 and New Life Tabernacle 2. One will be nothing but a database of all the old stuff, and uh, another one will be new stuff going forward. Am I saying that right? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So I want to mention that to you. If you're, The uh, reason I'm saying that, in the next couple of weeks, if you're going back trying to find some of this, part of it will be under the archived area because that's where the breach happened, and then the new stuff will be going forward. Now, for the seven pillars of wisdom to be erected in our lives, we have to start with the fear of God. That's the beginning of wisdom. Following this, we have to be born again. This is just a quick review of where we left last week. Born again, of course, is of water and spirit. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. We have to be born of water and spirit. Water baptism is the water birth. Spirit baptism is the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And then also verse 38 is when the New Testament church was born. So when you have wisdom, it's the fear of God. You have to lay that foundation and be born again of water and spirit. Now, the one in whom all wisdom is, is now in your life. So when you get the Holy Ghost, you get, literally, you get wisdom in you. That doesn't mean that we know how to, uh, to operate in that wisdom. It's a learning process. But I'm glad when I get the Holy Ghost, the one who has all wisdom, the one who is known as wisdom, is now living in my heart. Let's go to Colossians 2 and 3. We'll pick up with our new material here. Colossians 2 and 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So when you get in God and God gets in you, you get wisdom in you. You get knowledge in you. In Him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins. Furthermore, He has abounded toward us in all wisdom and 
prudence. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So available to every believer is this spirit of wisdom and revelation. Look down to verse 17 of that same chapter. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. So here Paul uses uh, wisdom in the context of a spirit. It's not another spirit. It's not a different spirit. When you get the Holy Ghost, you get in you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead, set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places. So when you get God, you get this wisdom. Now we can proclaim along with Paul in Romans chapter 11, verse number 33, Oh, the depth of of the riches, both the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Amen. And then last of all, Luke chapter 7 and verse number 35, wisdom is justified of her children. So erecting and exhibiting the seven pillars of wisdom becomes the supporting evidence that Christ lives in you. Amen. People can claim they have the Holy Ghost, but really the words that come out of their mouth the words that they post on social media, the attitude that they have, the way that they interact with lost people, the way they interact in their marriage, uh, the wisdom, it shows real quick whether or not they have the wisdom of God. Amen. Amen. In other words, you can, you can have a sign on the door that says Holy Ghost lives here, but people can tell real quick whether the Holy Ghost lives there. Amen. Amen. I don't want to just proclaim to have the goods. I want to actually have the goods. Nothing defines, supports, exalts, or characterizes wisdom more than her children. Luke 7.35. Wisdom is justified of her children. The seven pillars that we're going to talk about later are, of course, the children of wisdom. Now, before we get into the seven pillars of wisdom, as promised last week, I want to talk to you about the seven spirits of God. All right? We're going to start with John 4.24. God is a spirit. Some of you can quote it by heart. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Everybody say in spirit. In spirit. Everybody say truth. truth. Notice spirit here is a lowercase s. So it's not talking about the Holy Spirit. That's the first word of uh, first spirit of John 4, 24. God is a capital S spirit. So there's only one spirit. They that worship him must worship him in lowercase spirit and in truth. Those two words are different. One, of course, is talking about the one true spirit of God. And another is talking about our energy level. You can't worship God in spirit when you're half asleep. Amen. You can't worship God in spirit when you're yawning all during church. Or when your brain is a thousand miles away somewhere. Amen. And so we have to focus and worship God in spirit and in truth. So God is a spirit, John 4, 24. Now, stay with me because we're going to take a deep dive here in, in the Bible. Let's go to Ephesians 4, 4. Paul says that there is only one spirit. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. So how then can we say there are seven spirits of God if there's one spirit? There's one God who has seven different attributes. Let's use, let's use that analogy. Okay? There's one spirit that has seven different attributes. Revelations 1 and 4 John was on the island of Patmos when he received the revelation of Jesus Christ and he introduces us to the seven spirits of God. Again, not seven different brands of the Holy Ghost. There's only one Holy Ghost. There's only one spirit. Ephesians 4, 4, okay? I want to make sure everybody's understanding that. There's not seven gods. There's only one God, seven different ways he operates. There's only one spirit, seven different uh, Subcategories uh, of that one spirit Revelations 1 4 John to the seven churches which are in Asia Grace be unto you And peace from him which is And which was And which is to come And from the seven spirits which are before his throne So you say what in the world are These seven spirits Which are before his throne 
Let's go to Revelations 4 and 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So that's interesting. The seven spirits of God that are, de are described in Revelations 1 and 4 are also a synonymous term as the seven lamps of God in Revelations 4 and 5. Now let's go to 5 and 6 of Revelation. Next chapter over. Behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven heads, excuse me, seven horns and seven eyes. Look at this. Which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth? So I've read to you Revelations 1 4, Revelations 4 5, Revelations 5 6. All right, stay with me. This is not confusing, but you got to be paying attention. The seven spirits of God of Revelations chapter 1, verse number 4, are the same thing in Revelations 4, 5. The seven lamps of fire, it's the same thing. And they are all the same thing as found in Revelations 5, 6. Seven horns and seven eyes. What in the world are we talking about? All right. Well, the seven lamps of fire are burning before the throne, Revelations 4, 5. The seven horns are described in Revelations 5, 6. The seven eyes are described in Revelations 5, 6. Also, if you go back to the Old Testament, book of Zechariah, right before the ending, chapter 3, verse 9. I'm just showing you a few things here, and then we're going to tie it all together, so please don't be confused. Zechariah 3, 9. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. So these seven eyes are talked about all the way back in the Old Testament. Chapter 4, verse 10 of Zechariah, same book. For who hath despised the day of small things, they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. So the same eyes of, Re of Zechariah chapter 3 are the same seven eyes described in Zechariah chapter 4. Now, it's noteworthy to, to, let me tie it together, it's noteworthy to notice all of this. The seven spirits are before the throne, the Bible says. The seven spirits are then sent forth into all the earth, and it is the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who has those seven spirits. We read that in the book of Revelation. So in view of all these different facts and different scriptures, which seem to tie together, let's go to the Word and find out what are these seven spirits. Since they're sent throughout all the earth by Jesus Christ, they must be good because the Lord doesn't send bad spirits, Amen. right? They're good spirits. And if the Lord is sending them and they came from the throne, I want to know what they are. Well, I'm going to show you what they are. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse number 1. And the prophet Isaiah reveals what these seven spirits are. Chapter 11 verse 1, we're going to begin verse 1 down through verse 3. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. All right. Jesse is the father of David the king. You read the book of Ruth, the last chapter. David the king is the genealogical lineage that gives us the Messiah. If you read Matthew chapter 1, you can see the lineage of Jesus Christ. Jesse is, of course, in that lineage. And so when you read Isaiah 11 and 1, the capital B on branch, that's a proper noun. Isaiah the prophet is talking about the Messiah that's coming. Amen. A stem of Jesse. Just a little stem is going to come out of the family tree. And a branch will grow out of its roots. Verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Well, who was it that came out of David's lineage? That the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Jesus. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Now we know, of course, this is talking about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But I want to point out to you verse number 2. 
these seven spirits are identified. Highlight these as you go. Number one, the Spirit of the Lord shall be upon him. So one of the spirits is the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Jehovah. Number two, the Spirit of Wisdom. Number three, the Spirit of Understanding. Number four, the Spirit of Counsel. Number five, the Spirit of Might. Number six, the Spirit of Knowledge. Number seven, spirit of fear. These are all packed in that one verse. Verse two tells us what the seven spirits of the Lord are. And they're all attributed to the one stem of Jesse, the one branch, which we know in the New Testament is Jesus Christ. No doubt these are the same seven spirits that John witnessed in the book of Revelation being before the throne and being sent out into the earth. So if Jesus Christ sent the seven spirits, if the seven spirits are talked about in the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah says Jesus Christ will embody these seven spirits, while he was on the earth, he operates in these seven realms, he ascends into heaven, he pours his spirit out on you and I, and John in the book of Revelation said, I saw the seven spirits before the throne, and they were sent out into all the earth, What does that mean? That means that now you and I have the Holy Ghost. We get to operate in these seven spirits. Because Jesus lives in us. Look at your neighbor and say, that makes sense. sense. What did Jesus say? I'm going to pour out my spirit upon you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come again. And so Jesus poured out his spirit on us. But he didn't just give us just barely enough to get the Holy Ghost and be saved. He also gave us some of the same things that he operated in when he was walking on this earth. That's why Jesus could say, greater works than these shall ye do. You're mesmerized that I've healed the sick. You're mesmerized that I've raised the dead, Jesus said. You're mesmerized that I put eyeballs back in people's eye sockets. Greater works than these shall ye do. What was he saying? Don't think that I'm, I'm just, I just come and I'm an anomaly and I do all this and then I leave and, and keep looking back in the past at what a wonderful three and a half years that was. Walk in the present and say, I'm going to operate in that same power and that same anointing and that same wonderful, uh, powerful spirit that Jesus operated in because I have that same spirit in me. Certainly that doesn't mean any of us are little mini gods. That that would be false doctrine to think that. But we operate through the power of the Holy Ghost, folks. And we got to stop looking back at the New Testament and saying, man, I wish we could have those same things happen today. We can. You and I have got the same Holy Ghost because Jesus gave it to us. And he didn't give us an off-brand. He gave us the one true power of the Spirit. So when you and I receive the Comforter, when we get the Holy Ghost, which Christ sent back from heaven in John 14, 26, we get these seven spirits that we're able to operate in. John 14, 26, Jesus said, I'm going to give you the Comforter. Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things, bring to your remembrance whatsoever things I have said to you. So... When you get the Holy Ghost, when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you can be made partakers of these seven spirits of God, appropriating them in your life. They are all embodied in that one spirit of Ephesians 4.4. Paul said there's one spirit. Ephesians 4.4. One spirit. All right? 1 Corinthians 12.13. We are baptized into one body. One spirit that baptizes us into the one spirit. Body, But when we have that spirit, we have the power to operate in all of these realms. Now, available to us through the infilling of the Holy Ghost are all the attributes of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is wisdom, personified, now lives within us to share the same things that he shared. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear. Friend, if you don't have the Holy Ghost today, not, you don't just need the Holy Ghost so you can miss hell and make heaven. You need the Holy Ghost so you can operate in these, these realms of, of higher quality of living and uh, walking in the power of God. All right. I wanted to clear that up, seven spirits of God, so that there's no confusion as to the seven pillars of wisdom. Let's move to the seven pillars of wisdom. Wisdom, as most men often refer to it, can be acquired through time and experience. Whether you're a saint or a sinner, uh, it just goes without saying, the longer you do something, the better you become at it. And that can be a good thing, that can be a bad thing. The longer you live for God, 
The more efficient and the better you can become at it. The longer you don't live for God, the longer you live out in the world, the better and the more efficient you can become at that too. Amen. Remember I said, starting off a few weeks ago, there's good wisdom and there's bad wisdom. There's the wisdom of the world and there's the wisdom of God. Somebody can be a drug dealer long enough, they figure out how to be a really good drug dealer. We wouldn't really call that person wise, but they have some wisdom. I mean, they figured out how to weigh the stuff, to cut the stuff, to bag the stuff, what street corners to stand on, how to split the commission, how to avoid the, the police. They figured it all out. We wouldn't call, you and I would not look at our children and say, there's a wise man. We would never call them wise, but in reality, they have some wisdom. An assassin has some wisdom. They can go years and not get caught and kill people and they've learned how to do it. And that's it's a horrible thing. We would never tell our children, that's a wise person. We would never do that. But they're wise. They're wise in the wrong thing. You can gain wisdom in the wrong thing. Or you can seek after God's wisdom. Ecclesiastes 10 and 10, the Old Testament if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. You know, yesterday when we were out cleaning up this mess from the storm, uh, I noticed that probably 30, 40 minutes into constant chainsawing, Brother Derek would have to stop, take the saws him, Brother Bill, and go over there and sharpen the blades. Man, when they'd come back with those blades sharp, it sliced through that stuff like butter. But prior to that, it was, you could smell the oil, you could smell the heat, and the blades were locking up. And, you know, just a little bit of a sharpening caused it to be more efficient. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is learning, learning how to be more efficient in life and it being profitable to the Lord. Sages of the past have passed from generation to generation lessons and skills they've learned through trial and error. As generations build upon this wisdom, each succeeding age becomes more enlightened than the past in some ways. I will tell you that the generation of folks that are dying out now, the World War II generation, they had a lot of wisdom that this new generation is not grabbing a hold of. Amen. We, uh, we were talking about it, I think, Friday night after the uh, men's conference. We were sitting around fellowship in at Applebee's and had a good crowd there of our men those that were there, and we went out to eat afterwards, and we were uh, discussing it. And uh, I said, you know, there are whole things that, uh, genres of wisdom that this new generation has no ability to do. People don't even know how to can food anymore. I mean, I remember the older generation, when I was a child, going with my mom to people's houses in the church, everybody had canned foods. I don't mean canned like you buy from the store, glass mason jars. And everybody knew how to can food. Everybody knew how to get crops out of the field and can it and put it up. And you didn't see rows and rows and rows of aluminum cans. You saw rows and rows and rows of colorful glass jars. Amen. And okra and, 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 and sauerkraut and, and beans and even meat. And I mean, people can this stuff. Why? Because they were prudent. They were, they were wise. They had learned. Their parents had come through the Great Depression. And their parents had taught them. Unless you want to go hungry, you better learn how to do this. Right? A whole generation of uh, young ladies that knew how to sew. My mom used to have a sewing machine. She had a room in the house with a sewing machine. And, and I remember sewing kits. And, and uh, she'd get in there and had patterns. And she'd make dresses for ladies in the church. And, and we got a whole generation coming up that they wouldn't even know how to turn the thing on. I'm not being facetious. I'm just telling you. They don't know because nobody taught them. So there's a generation that stopped teaching the old ways and there's a generation coming up that unless you show them which button to push on the microwave, they can't even heat up their own ramen noodles. And we've lost that wisdom. Planting crops. My grandparents had a garden in the back and I remember going over there, up, upstate Maryland, grandpa going out and had a garden with stuff planted. It wasn't huge, but it was just enough that he knew if we need some food, there's some food. Amen. Wisdom. Guys that used to go out and hunt deer and venison and know how to skin it. And, and, uh, and I'm talking about old ways that the new generation has no clue because you can't stick it in a cartridge in the, in the monitor and, and play it on your game. Right? And I'm not being facetious. I'm just telling you that we're losing some of that wisdom. Amen. 
In the spiritual realm, though, I want to introduce you to two kinds of wisdom. Both affect the inward man and originate from two opposite and opposing directions. And so, to illustrate this, let's turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse number 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. So there is a flavor of wisdom that doesn't come from heaven. It's earthly, it's sensual, it's devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Look at this, pure. Then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Well, that's the kind of wisdom I want right there. I don't want any wisdom that's, that's got the word devilish attached to it. Amen. I want wisdom that comes from above. And now notice, James doesn't say the, the devilish wisdom comes from below. He just says it's devilish. But he uses the words, talking about the other type of wisdom, he said it comes from above. Yeah. By process of elimination, the devilish wisdom, if it doesn't come from above, guess where it comes from? Below. below. And I don't want any kind of wisdom that comes from below. So let's talk about the wisdom that is not from above for just a moment. You read it. James said it's earthly, it's sensual, it is devilish. Its attributes are bitter envying. That's what he said, bitter envying and strife. Bitter envying and strife. Verse 16. Where envying and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. So when you get this wisdom from below, when you get this devilish wisdom, this sensual, this earthly wisdom, it causes two things. It causes bitter envying and it causes strife. And wherever these two things are, James said in verse 16, there comes confusion and every evil work. Amen. Bishop Godair was just deaf on higher education. I mean, we, our church was in Durham which is the home of Duke University. And that was that generation. I don't fault him for that. He came out from that second World War II generation. And uh, those guys had bad experiences with higher education because they'd send their kids off to college and they'd come back book smart but backslid. They thought they had got so much knowledge and education they did not need to pray anymore. I'm above prayer. I'm above church church bunch of farmers and bunch of blue collar workers i operate in a higher realm of knowledge and that old generation said we're just going to start preaching against college because these people are backsliding in college and they did i wasn't allowed to go to college in in uh in my home church because of that of course when i came to kernersville i realized it's hard to feed a family with a bread man's salary so i went to college and went on to law school but friend you've got to learn that when you get in the classroom and they're pushing this garbage down your throat you got to stay full of the holy ghost and you got to stay you got to say okay you may think that and you may believe that and i'm gonna pass this class and i'm gonna be like beef stew i'm gonna reach in grab out what i want and i'm gonna leave the rest of it in the pot you're not gonna affect me right I'm going to pass this class. And I remember having a conversation with my biology professor. I said, I'm going to make an A in this class, and I'm going to pass this class. And when I walk out, you'll still be an atheist, and I'll still be a believer. And I did. And Dr. Thompson and I had a great relationship. And I killed that class. I I approached it from a Bible quizzing perspective. I put every word on flashcards. I had had 1,500 flashcards. I memorized those flashcards because I thought, I'm not going to let this atheist see me do bad in his class. And I passed it. So you can go to college. You can go to business school. You can go get your master's. You can get your doctorate. You can can increase in education. I want to encourage everybody that has a thirst for education, do that. But don't allow this wisdom that is from below taint your Holy Ghost. Stay full of the Spirit. Live for God. Go in an apostolic and come out an apostolic. And show the higher places of education that... Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. 
Amen. I, I commuted to High Point University as a day student. I went every, every day, commuted, never stayed in the dorm, never mingled with the crowd there. They would come in class and sit down. I was already situated, talking about drinking and drugging and, and their orgies and all this filth that they had been involved in. And I, I, was, I, was, I had kids, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to pass this class. I'm going to get out. I'm going to make a great, great grade. I got out summa cum laude, 3.95 uh, GPA, and was able to get into higher education. And the day I graduated is the very first day I went to the cafeteria because they said, all graduates get a donut and a cup of coffee. And I said, yeah, where's that at? <laughs> I ain't never turned down a donut or a cup of coffee. That's the first day I ever went to the cafeteria. I had been there four years and never even stepped into the cafeteria. I didn't even know where it was. I had to ask the security guard, where is the cafeteria? He said, you're graduating. I said, I know. I've never been to the cafeteria. I bring my lunch. Right? So you can go to college and school and you can get your education and stay full of the Holy Ghost. That's the point. If I can do it, anybody can. Somebody say amen. So we don't want this wisdom from below. This kind of wisdom controls our lives and we are not to glory in it. Neither are we to lie. Neither to hide and, and let it cover up uh, the existence of the Holy Ghost in us. Shame, confession of our wrong and repentance. These are the things that are in order and provide the only remedy and deliverance from this type of wisdom. Wisdom of this type, this lower type of wisdom, originated in the Garden of Eden. And if you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 6, we first see this type of wisdom rear its ugly head. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. The woman saw the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. Look at that. So Eve said, hey... I can partake of this fruit, and I can be wise, just like God. Well, that wasn't the Lord telling her to do that, because the Lord had already said, y'all don't touch this tree. Don't, don't, don't eat this tree. Don't mess with this tree. You can groom it. You have to, you have to dung it. You have to make sure you, you, you take care of it, but you cannot eat of the fruit of this tree. And so here, here's Eve saying, if I eat of it, I'll become wise like God. God's not going to violate his own word. So where did this urge come from? This is that earthly wisdom, that fleshly wisdom, that devilish wisdom. Satan deceived Eve into thinking that if she and Adam ate of the fruit, they would acquire a wisdom that heretofore have been hidden from them. And it was hidden from them because there are some things God said that you don't need to know in this garden. You're in paradise, he said. You don't need to know knowledge of good and evil. Well, I want to. You know, I think God shields us from some, from some stuff. We're just so silly. We don't even recognize how valuable it is to be shielded from it. I mean, can you imagine? Here's God telling Adam and Eve, I promise you, trust me, you don't want to have to get up and go to work every day. You don't want to have to go shopping for school clothes every year. You don't want to have to worry about your shoes wearing out. Trust me, I promise you. Walk around buck naked and don't worry about a thing. You don't need a knowledge of good and evil. But we want one. <sighs> what is it about human nature that we've got to touch the, the wall that has the wet paint sign on it? We've just got to touch it. Right? We've got to, we've got to go there. God says you don't need that wisdom. Amen. Sometimes it's better to know not. And it's better to know not that you know not. Upon surrendering to Satan's deceit, man became a candidate for this earthly, sensual, devilish wisdom. Now, let's compare that to the wisdom that is from above. James chapter 3, let's go back there again. And James says, this is the wisdom that's from above. And if it's wisdom from above, friend, that's what I want. Amen. Verse number 17 of James chapter 3. This form of wisdom comes from heaven. It is not earthly. It is not sensual. It is not devilish. So it does not produce confusion. It does not produce evil works. It does not produce envy and strife. Only through the power of the Holy Ghost can you and I get this wisdom. And when you get God in your life, when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and you speak with other tongues, you receive not only the Holy Ghost, but you get the whole package deal that comes along with the Holy Ghost. His Spirit bears within it the seven spirits of God that are sent into all the earth. By experiencing the new birth, we get to receive this wisdom from above. So let's talk about the first pillar of seven. And we will not be able to finish today, but at least finally after four weeks, we're there. 
The first pillar is pure. James chapter 3, verse number 17. God's Spirit is termed as the Holy Ghost. Everybody say Holy Ghost. His Spirit is holy. Just the word, the name of it, it's holy. It purifies our souls. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 22. Let's go there. 1 Peter 1, 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Notice the word Spirit there is capitalized. That's talking about the Holy Ghost. The Bible uses the term Spirit. Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. These are all synonymous terms. Amen. And so the first pillar of wisdom is that it is pure. Pure in this verse, let's go back to uh, our text here that we're, that we're reading, these seven pillars here. Pure in this verse means clean. It means honest. It means modest. And it means chaste. Amen. Clean. Look at that. Innocent. Modest. Chaste. So the wisdom that comes from above, when you get this wisdom, James chapter 3, verse 17, first of all, it helps you to be pure. Now, we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. If anybody claims to be perfect, they just committed their first imperfection because lying is not perfect. Right? None of us are perfect. But we strive for perfection. And it's not a sin to strive for perfection. It's not a sin to try to do your best to live as clean and godly of a life as you can. Realizing that we're human and we make mistakes and we fall. But the, the secret is when you fall, don't stay down. Get back up and try it again. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. Everybody makes mistakes. Amen. But when you make a mistake, find a place to pray and say, God, I don't want to do that. I don't want to say that. I don't want to think that. I don't want to act that way. I don't want to feel that way. Please forgive me. God, help me not to do it again. And you get up and say, okay, I'm going to try this again. That's the secret. Amen. So you and I can be striving for perfection and understanding that as humans we fall short of perfection. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 5. 1 Timothy 1, 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Everybody say pure. Pure, pure heart. And of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So God's word speaks of Christians having a Pure heart. First Peter 1 Peter 1.22, we read it just a moment ago. We should have a pure heart. Also in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9, God's word speaks of Christians having a pure conscience. 1 Timothy 3, 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Amen. So the word pure is used to describe heart, and it's used to describe the word conscience. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1, the word pure is describing of the word mind. 2 Peter 3.1 This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So this first pillar of wisdom is the word pure, James 3.17. So when we talk about the word pure, put the uh, picture back up of the seven pillars of wisdom. These seven pillars are holding the house up. These seven pillars are holding your spiritual life up. The first one, let's say the one on the far left, that's pure. Okay? So when we talk about purity, God's word demands of us, not suggests, demands of us that we be pure morally, mentally, spiritually, and doctrinally. Purity is a pillar supporting and justifying our claim to wisdom. In this last day and age, we have to be aware of false doctrine. We should not allow any false doctrine to come into our lives at all. No false doctrine to come into our lives. Amen. And if it's not in the Word, I don't want it. If it's not in the Word, I don't want to hear it. I'm sick and tired of people getting up and saying, I had a dream, I had a revelation. God said this, and it's completely opposite of what the Bible said. God is never going to tell you something different than what His Word says. If he gives you a dream, a revelation, it's going always to agree with the word. His word is pure. Amen. Amen. So purity is the first pillar of wisdom. The second pillar of wisdom, give me five more minutes, is peaceable. Peaceable. 
Those endowed with the wisdom that is from above are peaceable people. Shock of all shocks. Consider that. Jesus was peaceable. Doesn't mean he was a doormat. Jesus riled up every now and then when he had good reason to, but peaceable. People that have the, this peaceable spirit understand, listen closely, confusion, strife, envy, backbiting, gossip contaminates them and does more harm to the work of God than it does good. People that are full of envy, backbiting, gossip, are not peaceable. Now why is it getting so quiet right now? Do we believe this? Amen. Maybe you're uncomfortable saying amen if you're gossiping and backbiting and slandering and murmuring. But if you're not, you can go ahead and say amen to the preacher. It's okay. Amen. People that understand these biblical facts about being peaceable understand Matthew 5 and 9. They are peacemakers. Matthew 5 and 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are called the children of God. Amen. The peacemakers. Peacemaker does not mean you got a Smith & Wesson in each hand, and therefore you're a peacemaker. That's not what it means here. Okay, A peacemaker is someone who seeks peace and looks at a situation and says, how can I diffuse this? Doesn't mean they're compromising truth. We don't ever compromise truth. Jesus was a peacemaker. But when Jesus went to the temple and saw people in there ripping off people in the temple, he got mad, made a whip, and drove them all out. He was a peacemaker, but that day he was making peace another way. Amen. Okay? My house shall be called a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. Now, you and I would never dare look at Jesus and say, I can't believe you got upset. You're a peacemaker. There's a time and a place to have anger. There's a time and a place to be riled up. If something is violative of truth, I'm going to walk to this pulpit and I'm going to handle it. And I'm a peacemaker. But that day I'm making peace in another way. But we should seek peace in our daily life. We should seek peace. And uh, folks that are just constantly embroiled in controversy just wear me out. And I hope they wear you out as well. There's some people you just need to detach yourself from because every day I think they get up and say, Who can I offend today? They just love living in controversy. Maybe it just brings some excitement to their otherwise bored life. But, man, I got enough excitement going on without looking for controversy. Let's go to James 3 and 18. The fruit of righteousness, the Bible says, is sown in peace of them that make peace. James 3, 18. Romans chapter 4, 14, verse 19. I know we're flipping quickly here. I'm going to try to end this particular portion before we segue. Romans chapter 14, verse 19. We are to follow after things which make for peace. Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Amen. Just as an aside, you and I as Christians, we should not be involved in any kind of group or uh, group effort or club or gathering where violence is espoused. United Pentecostal Church ministers are not allowed to be a part of secret societies. I've said that before. We're not allowed to be a part of secret societies because they require an oath to something other than God. And we don't swear on anything other than, well, we don't swear on anything. We affirm on the word, but we don't swear on anything. They require an oath to something other than God. And many of them have espoused violent tenets. Case in point. The Proud Boys are right now in the news. A bunch of them are going to jail. Probably started out being just a group of good old boys that got together and said, man, our, our nation's going down the toilet. We need to rise up and do something about it. And Let's stockpile some food and stockpile some water and stockpile some medicines. And before you know it, now there are a, bunch, a bunch of them are going to jail because they were in the Capitol doing something they shouldn't have done. I'm not being political today, but I'm just telling you, we as Holy Ghost-filled Christians, we don't get sucked into that stuff. Amen. Okay? The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You wage your war down on your knees. You wage your war in prayer. You wage your war in the word. You wage your war by making sure you're driving out whatever it is in your house that shouldn't be there. The violence that we do is not taking up arms and causing destruction to property. That's not the violence that we do. 
And I'm an American. I'm patriotic. I don't want anybody to walk out of here and think that, that this old boy right here is not American, not patriotic. But if you don't like the way our nation is going, for God's sake, walk into the little booth, pick up the little pencil, make a little X on the little ballot, and make a big change. That's how you change your world. Vote the scoundrels out if you don't like it. But Christians don't get involved in destruction of property. If you want to protest something, protest peaceably. If you don't like the way something's going in your community, show up at the town hall and speak out peaceably. But we don't harm people and property. Christians don't do that. We follow after peace. Somebody say amen. And I know that idea is not popular because there is, we're living in such a violent world. And, uh, but as Holy Ghost filled Christian friend, you've got to understand, would Jesus be sitting right here today in this meeting? And would Jesus be doing what these people are saying I need to do? And I don't think Jesus would do that. Praise God. All right, we've run out of time. Thank you for your patience. I've not finished this idea of peaceable being one of the seven pillars. We'll pick back up where we left off um, next week. Does anybody have a quick question about anything we've talked about today? Does anybody have a question? All right. God bless you. All minds clear. I think everybody just needs to go to the bathroom, probably. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you for being attentive. I love all of you. We're going to have a great service today. And at the end of the service, Brother David Alonzo is going to get baptized in Jesus' name. Maybe. We'll talk about it. He was as of Wednesday night, but we'll talk about it. Amen. I love all of you. Use the restroom. Get some water. And we'll have a great service. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.